next on Unsolved Mysteries. A man struck by lightning is on the brink of death until a mysterious lady in black peers out of nowhere. He said he was a film producer, but he was really a fast-talking hustler wanted for sexual assault. A pilot flying a covert mission for the CIA disappears in Latin America. Was he part of a secret war against Cuba? And a small-time businessman is murdered in his own office. It looks like a professional hit. But who is behind it? Five stories. They're all strange. But you know what? They're all true. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Every year, 39 million visitors pour into Las Vegas, the gambling capital of the world. Most come for one reason only, money. So it's no surprise that Las Vegas also attracts every kind of hustler and con artist imaginable. Yes, well, I talked to two of the guys yesterday. They seem to be uh, excited about this. Maxwell Carson was a smooth talker who owned and operated a sports betting business an up-and-coming film company, and a modeling agency. But Max Carson was a man with a dark past. He was an ex-police officer gone bad. His real name was William John Wood. In 1972, he resigned from the Toledo, Ohio Police Force. He was under investigation for misconduct. Wood served time for a number of offenses, including assault with intent to rape. Okay, chin down. When he was released from prison, okay. Wood moved to Las Vegas and created a new identity. Producer and star maker, right there. Max Carson. Max was absolutely obsessed with good looking women. Okay. He would, especially with actresses, models, any good looking women, use his clout as, quote unquote, a movie producer to be, uh, could get them whatever they wanted. Tiffany? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Carson, I'll see you now. When Carson held auditions for a film he was producing, a 19-year-old model, who we'll call Tiffany, showed up for an interview. Hi, how are you? Hi, great, thank have you. A, have a seat. You're? I'm Tiffany. Tiffany. Yes, I am. I went in, I talked to him. He told me a little bit about what the movie was about and uh, what I would be doing. Role in there for you. Of course, the speaking part. Mm. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. He had started talking about money, and I felt strange that he would offer a large amount of money to someone in my position that's never really had any acting before. So I talked to a couple agents, and they'd all heard of him. They had done their homework on him and found that there was nothing wrong with him. Super. Well, we've got your address and phone number and how to get in touch with you, and I appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. A short time later, the movie fell through and Carson's business began to collapse. We have employees that haven't been paid. Now, Bob, just relax. Have faith. Carson shut down his offices, but he pretended that he was still in business. Hello. I'd like to speak to Tiffany. Three months after her interview, he called Tiffany and hired her as a last-minute replacement model for a photo shoot. Carson arranged to meet her later that day at a restaurant on the Strip. Max? Oh, hi. We're all hi. set up. We got uh, two rooms set up. I met him in front of the coffee shop, and he said that we needed to go to a motel there where they had set up a dressing room for me. Here's the limousine we're going to be using. And, uh, oh, I want to thank you very much for coming here on a short notice. This uh, shoot should be probably about two hours. You'll be done, and those dresses are just fine. Uh, I started to um, 
feel a little uncomfortable just because there was no one around. Tiffany, why don't you just go over there and fill out those forms and I'll make a call. I left the door open with my bag sitting between the room and the door so that it would make it a little bit difficult to get the door shut. Uh, this is Max Carson. Listen, I'm expecting somebody in very shortly and... Uh... Supposedly, he was calling the makeup artist and uh, the photographer to let them know that we're here and waiting. Yes, okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And about that time, he had asked me if I would give him a hug. And I knew that I was in trouble. Uh, Max, I don't feel very comfortable, okay? Um, I'm what, what do you mean you don't feel very comfortable? Let's just forget about the whole thing, Max. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> don't make a sound. Do what I say and I won't hurt you. I thought at that point that I was going to die. I tried very hard to cooperate, hoping that that would keep him from becoming more violent. After the assault, Carson let Tiffany go. She immediately called the police, even though he had threatened to accuse her of prostitution if she did. Carson was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and battery. But by then, he had disappeared. Two months later, Carson surfaced in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Once again, he tried to work a scam on a beautiful woman. Hi, I hope I didn't keep you waiting. No, I just jumped down here. Well, I've been here before. Why don't you, uh, we go upstairs in the lounge? Well, um, how about downstairs? I just Carson to... and the woman had arranged to meet in the lobby of a hotel. But he wanted to continue their conversation okay. in a private room upstairs. Carson had convinced the woman to accept money for sex. Max Carson had walked into a clever trap. The woman was wearing a hidden microphone as part of a sting operation. He pleaded guilty to solicitation of prostitution, but police in Florida had no idea that he was wanted in Las Vegas. Two days later, Carson was released from jail and disappeared once again. Only then did police discover his true identity. Update. William John Wood has been captured. One of our viewers phoned the FBI after recognizing Wood as San Francisco resident Brian O'Leary. He was returned to Las Vegas to stand trial and was sentenced to six years for coercion and 20 years for attempted sexual assault. He served his time and has been released. Next, a plane vanishes while on a secret mission. One eyewitness claims that he saw the pilot in a Cuban jail. On an early autumn day in the middle of the Cold War, 28-year-old Jeffrey Sullivan, a former Air Force pilot, prepared to depart on a secret mission. The way my mom relates it, my father was supposed to come back in five days. I'll give you a call as soon as I get a chance to. I don't know if he was nervous, but he gave her his St. Christopher medal, which he wore all the time. He explained to her that this would be his last trip. Not because he wasn't coming back, but because he didn't want to be involved in this type of operation anymore. He took off that morning, and that was the last time she ever saw him. He never came back. Four days later, Jeffrey disappeared somewhere over the Caribbean. Sherry Sullivan was only seven years old when she lost her father. Years later, she became a private investigator and one of her toughest cases was uncovering the truth about her father's disappearance. No one wanted to say he wasn't coming back. As it rolled into the years, it was the kind of thing that just wasn't talked about. I mean, no one knew what to say. None of us were ever allowed to go through a grieving process because as far as we were concerned, he wasn't dead. 
Jeffrey Sullivan earned his Air Force wings in 1957. After receiving his honorable discharge in 1959, Sullivan became a freelance commercial pilot. At about that time, Fidel Castro's revolution swept through Cuba. The communist threat was now only 90 miles from American shores. Once Castro took power, the U.S. government and several Cuban exile groups launched campaigns to overthrow his regime. It was the shadowy world of these covert operations that may have cost Jeffrey Sullivan his life. Jeffrey? Yeah, Alex Rourke? Uh, Alex, in 1961, a suspected CIA operative named Alex Rourke hired Jeffrey as a pilot for secret missions against Cuba. Their covert actions range from distributing anti-Castro leaflets to dropping homemade bombs. At the Bay of Pigs that same year, U.S.-backed Cuban exiles failed in their attempt to invade the island and overthrow Castro. 18 months later, Soviet missiles were discovered in Cuba. For seven days, the world was on the brink of nuclear war. After the missile crises, operations against Cuba were still carried on by the U.S. government, but uh, they were trying to be more discreet about it. They did shed some of the more loose cannon operations, and I think Alex Rourke's could have been classified as such. There was a public order uh, to men like uh, Alexander Rourke and Jeffrey Sullivan to stop their operations against Cuba altogether. Eight days after the warning was issued, Jeffrey left Connecticut. The next day, he was seen in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with Alex Rourke. There, Jeffrey and Rourke met with two men. One of them was Frank Sturgis, who had also been named in the public warning. Years later, Sturgis would become well-known for his role in the Watergate scandal. Rourke told me he did buy a B-25 bomber, and he wanted to take the B-25 to Nicaragua. He wanted to sit down and talk with General Somoza in order to have a base of operations in Nicaragua and for bombing missions inside of Cuba. Sturgis convinced Rourke to meet with Nicaraguan officials and clear the way. The men rented an airplane and planned to leave for Nicaragua the following day. That morning, Rourke's wife drove him to the Opelok Airport in Fort Lauderdale. On the way, he picked up another man. Mrs. Rourke didn't know who this gentleman was. He spoke broken English. But she drove the both of them to the airport where my father was and dropped them off. The twin-engine plane took off from Fort Lauderdale with Jeffrey, Alex Rourke, and the mysterious stranger, Frank Sturgis, stayed behind. Jeffrey Sullivan's activities over the next 48 hours still cannot be fully explained. According to the FAA investigation, Jeffrey's flight activities were highly unusual. He would return to Fort Lauderdale three times. For some reason, on his third trip to the airport, the plane's landing gear remained in the oh, up position. To be up. Side step to the right and go around. Sullivan did not attempt to land at Fort Lauderdale again. Sullivan did finally land at North Perry Airport, a mere 30 miles from Fort Lauderdale. But he took a suspiciously long time getting there. What should have been a 25 minute flight had taken nearly five hours. No one knows where the plane was during that time. After refueling, Jeffrey and his passengers took off again. The flight plan listed Tegucigalpa, Honduras as their final destination. A little more than two hours later, Sullivan radioed the tower at Miami International Airport. This time, he filed a new flight plan. This time, he listed Tocumen, Panama as his destination. Sullivan attempted to file a flight plan for a destination that was some two hours beyond the normal range of his aircraft. When he was informed of this by the air traffic controller on duty, 
He then changed his destination. However, this destination was also well beyond the range of the aircraft he was flying. Seven more hours passed with no contact from the plane. Finally, at 10.22 p.m., Sullivan again radioed the Miami Tower. This time, he filed a flight plan for Belize. The FAA says that Sullivan refueled just after midnight in Cozumel, Mexico. This was the last sighting of the plane. Jeffrey Sullivan and his companions were assumed lost at sea. Despite a massive search, no trace of the plane or its passengers was ever found. More than two decades later, Sherry Sullivan and her attorney petitioned the government for information concerning her father. They received over 5,000 pages of documentation from 14 federal agencies, including the FBI and the CIA. More than a third of the 800 pages received from the FBI were censored. According to Sherry, information found in these documents indicates that at least 400 more pages exist, but were withheld for national security reasons. It was almost really the confirmation we were looking for in a way, saying there is something here. In the FBI documents, Sherry found the name Floyd Park. She finally reached him by phone. Park told Sherry that he had seen her father two days after he supposedly disappeared. Floyd Park indicated that he had seen my father and Alex and a Spanish fella in Belize. We have not been able to verify the identity of Floyd Park, who he is really, and what he was involved in in the 60s, and how my father would have known him, why they would have stopped to see him. We weren't really able to get those answers from him. Sherry only talked to Park once and has not been able to reach him since. But Park did say that her father and Rourke might have been taken prisoner in Cuba. Fidel Castro, from what I've heard, had a bounty out on my father and Alex. He knew what they were involved in. He knew they were going in and out of his country. So there's a very good possibility that they could have ended up in Cuba. Probably some way they landed in Cuba. During her investigation, Sherry spoke with Marty Casey, who was in Cuba two years after her father disappeared. I was with two Cuban exiles from Miami, and they met a fellow that they knew from the area. He was working in the compound. He recognized my American accent. I was speaking Spanish, and he asked me, do you know Rorky? And I said, what do you mean O'Rourke? No, Rorky, the pilot. No, el piloto es Sullivan. No, no, the other guy was the pilot, he's Sullivan. And I said, well, how do you know them? And they, he said, uh, I was in jail here with him two years ago. Another name Sherry found in the FBI documents was Enrique Molina Garcia, supposedly a double agent for Castro's government. Sherry believes Garcia was the mysterious third man on the plane and that he tricked her father and Rourke into flying to Cuba. Unconfirmed reports have placed Garcia in Havana years after Sherry's father disappeared. Today, Sherry believes that her father was most likely jailed in Cuba and either died there or was executed. On the 40th anniversary of Jeffrey Sullivan's disappearance, a commemorative grave marker was unveiled in the Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Augusta, Maine. The Veterans Administration is the first and only government agency to officially recognize Jeffrey Sullivan as missing in action. Sherry Sullivan has not given up hope that she will someday discover her father's feet. Coming up, life leaves a man close to death. Who was the mysterious stranger claiming that she had the power to heal him? Acton, Indiana. Robert Davidson is riding his motorcycle down Interstate 74, enjoying a warm June day. And then 
it starts to rain. When you're driving 60, 65 mile an hour on a motorcycle and when raindrops hit you, it's really pretty stingy. It hurts. And I thought, better pull over and get my rain jacket out of the trunk. I had one foot on the ground, and that's the last thing I can remember. It was a direct hit. 200,000 volts of electricity. Robert should have died right there on the spot. But today, he is very much alive, thanks to what he believes was a miracle delivered personally by a messenger of God. Paramedics were on the scene within minutes of the lightning strike. Clinically, he should have been dead by the color of his skin. And when we arrived, there was no blood pressure, no pulse. Basically, he had no chance at all. Thelma, I'm going to need a chopper in here right away. This guy's in bad shape. According to witnesses, what happened next seemed almost supernatural. First, every power circuit in the ambulance failed at once. The engine shut down, the lights turned off, and it was without power completely. We got dual batteries. Uh, one battery would go down, the other one would take over. And uh, there's no way they could have both gone down at the same time. It was an eerie feeling. I mean, you could just, it felt strange. And as they were doing the CPR, you heard this woman coming up yelling, I need to touch him. I need to touch him. Just let me touch him. I must touch him. Nobody knew her name or where she came from. Later, she was referred to as the Lady in Black. She just kept again and again and again, you know, I can save his life. And of course, you know, at that point in time, I kind of thought, well, maybe this is just uh, one of the people, so to speak, left over from the 70s, you know. <laughs> but I said, you know, let her do what she needs to do. You know, what can it hurt? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth she me was dressed the in the late 1800 dress, your basic black dress, and she had the old-fashioned black shoes that went with it and carried her little black Bible. Then uh, she raised the Bible to the sky and started speaking in tongue, uh, which um, was something I didn't understand, but I'm sure somebody out there did. You could just feel all the time that she was saying it's just chills from head to toe. It was like just this tremendous amount of energy. When she was finished, she looked at me, smiled, and got up and walked away. Probably five seconds had passed by, and I turned to look the direction where she had left, and there was nobody to be found. But reports from that day seemed to contradict each other. Some eyewitnesses, including two of the paramedics, insist that the mysterious woman was never there. I, I don't know why they couldn't see her, really, because it was plain as day to me, it was plain as day to Randy. You know, why couldn't anyone else see her or hear her? There is no doubt in my mind that she was there. I believe there was a power that actually shut the vehicle down, a surge which just obliterated the vehicle's power supply and shut it down when this woman walked by. But according to those who saw the lady in black, the moment she vanished, the ambulance came back to life. And then... I've got it, I've got a pulse! So did Robert Davidson. It was a welcome to hear that first heartbeat. And I yelled again. I think everybody could have heard me down the interstate because I was so happy that we was getting some vital signs. Robert had a heartbeat, but his condition was critical. The ER doctor was not hopeful. My prognosis was that he would not come out of his coma. And I expected him to remain in permanent coma and ultimately uh, suffer complications and ultimately die. For nearly two months, Robert remained in a deep coma. And then one day, he simply woke up and resumed his life. When I came out of the coma, I looked around and I couldn't figure out what I was doing in the hospital. When it became apparent that uh, he indeed woke up and uh, not only woke up but was talking and walking, 
uh, it, uh, I was utterly amazed. Robert's incredible recovery led some to speculate that the woman in black was far more than just a person who happened by. They believe that she was a spirit that rose up from the area's religious past. Just down the road from where Robert was struck by lightning lies this quiet meadow. It's the site of a 19th century spiritual retreat known as Acton Campground. More than 100 years ago, this spot was the site of fiery sermons, gospel hymns, and the sound of faithful speaking in tongues. Most of Acton Campground burned down in 1905, but a few artifacts can still be found at a local museum. One of the relics on display is a vintage dress. It is very similar to the one worn by the Lady in Black. This woman maybe had been a pastor, a reverend, or a priestess in her life prior. And when she passed on, she was brought into, I guess, a guardian angel form. I know I witnessed a miracle. I, there's just no other words to say it. It was a miracle. Some might argue that Robert's life was saved by quick-acting paramedics and nothing more. But others believe that the lightning bolt awakened the spirits of Acton Campground and that one of them came to his rescue. I've always kind of believed that everybody has a guardian angel, but most people never get to see him or have him really do anything for him. I think my angel was doing her job that day. execution-style murder of a well-liked businessman. Was he living a double life? Ypsilanti, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit. On a winter morning, two men enter the real estate office of Jack Brown. As one stands guard, the other heads towards Jack's office. Yeah, yeah, we have trouble here. The men appear to be familiar with the layout of the building. I think you're pretty smart, don't you? Well, maybe. Don't move! Wait in the back, wait in the back! Come on! Come on, come on! Get in there and close the door! Now! The intruders lock the three employees in the bathroom and then walk away. Jack Brown never regains consciousness and dies 12 hours later from a single bullet wound to the neck. The murder of Jack Brown appeared to be a cold-blooded contract killing planned and executed by professionals. But police had no motive. Who would order a hit on a small town realtor and why? Jack's real estate brokering business put him in contact with many members of the community. No one could imagine why he would be targeted by a killer. Who has this to find you? Classic Victoria. There was absolutely nothing in Jack's background that I was aware of that would warrant uh, any kind of problem whatsoever. Uh, and surely not the, the tragedy that happened here. My opinion of the gunmen is that they came here to challenge Jack in some way. We got trouble here. I heard the gunman say, you think you're smart, don't you? And I heard Jack say in kind of a halting voice, well, well, maybe. At that point, the gun went off, and I guess I really figured that we had bought the farm, that they were then going to get rid of three eyewitnesses to a murder. But I guess looking back on it, it would seem to me to be a case where whatever problem they had was with Jack and not uh, the rest of us that happened to be in the office that fateful morning. No one seems to know anything uh, shady about Jack or anything that he might have been involved in that could be termed shady which leads us to believe that maybe he was living a double life, was involved in something that no one knew about. The night before Jack was killed, 
his brother saw him on the telephone. We're back. We're back on the phone. The conversation seemed to leave him extremely agitated. I can tell, you know, by the conversation that he was getting upset. So when he finally, you know, hung the phone up, I uh, asked him if there's a problem. Oh, uh, uh, that's that's nothing. I just got a few problems I got to work out. You guys have a good time at the poker game. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Okay. I honestly feel, you know, in my own heart that something about that phone call was involved with what happened the following day. It's really strange when someone is murdered or taken from you suddenly like this, that you look back and you search your mind, you search everywhere for clues, and you remember things that someone said that didn't fit. It was a fun party, wasn't it? Yeah, I really liked it. Jack and I had been to a Christmas party, and I was just a little irritated with him because he'd had a bit much to drink, and he was kind of rambling. But what would you do if you knew some very important people, some very powerful people did something very wrong? Would you write their names in a list and, and put it in a safe deposit box? What are you talking about? probably safer for you not to know. <laughs> you know, when I talk to you and tell you these things that my husband said to me, I, I'm almost embarrassed. <laughs> it just sounds so unreal. But he told me that it, it was not something I should know. And it may sound silly, but I believed him. After I recovered from the initial shock of his death, then these little comments that he dropped in conversation started coming back to me. And I searched for that safety deposit key. It was nowhere in my house. I want to know who those powerful people were. I want to know what their names are. I want the killers, the people that actually did it, but I want to know the people that hired them. The same day that Jack was murdered, the police conducted a major drug bust in the area. The raid had been triggered by an unknown informant. Some wondered if there might be a connection to Jack. I think it's very possible there are people in the community that know more about what happened. For some reason, either they're afraid to say, or maybe if he knew something about someone else, that person's obviously not going to tell us what they know. It really seems unfair because Jack didn't deserve to die. You know, I've thought in my mind that maybe I didn't want to know that if he did something bad, I don't want to know about it. But it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> I can think of anything he could have done that would give those people the right to come in and take his life. You're pretty smart, don't you? The gunman was approximately six feet tall and wore a beige jacket and light-colored pants. He was armed with a 38 caliber revolver. His accomplice was about five feet, 10 inches tall and was wearing coveralls and a blue knit stocking cap. He was armed with an automatic handgun. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a convicted con woman jumps bail, but is she really a woman? And a Jordanian serviceman called away to war searches for his son he was forbidden to see. Previously, we profiled the case of Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael, a Los Angeles businesswoman who claimed that she was going to revolutionize the auto industry. Carmichael told investors that she had designed a car that could get up to 70 miles per gallon. She called it the Dale and promised it would soon be in production. Carmichael collected over $1 million from investors. We went to the research and development lab and observed what appeared to be people appearing to be busy. But upon inspection of this vehicle, it was not a viable vehicle at all. It had no engine. Two by fours were holding up the rear wheel. The accelerator was just sitting on the floor. It wasn't even attached. And the vehicle just absolutely did not exist. Mr. Carmichael, police officers, we have a warrant. When police arrived at Carmichael's home, she and her family had fled. 
Authorities tracked her to Miami, where she was living under the alias Susan Raines. But Elizabeth Carmichael was hiding a much bigger secret. She was really a man, Jerry Dean Michael. I never thought that Liz was a man. I always thought that, and she is today, she's still Liz to me, still a female. Has the jury reached its verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. We find a defendant guilty. Jerry Dean Michael was convicted on 34 counts of conspiracy, grand theft, and fraud. He was released on $50,000 bail and appealed his conviction for the next three years. Then, when he didn't show up for sentencing, police found that he and his family had disappeared once again. Update. After the story aired, two viewers called to report that Jerry Dean Michael was living near Austin, Texas, under the assumed name Catherine Johnson. He had made his home in the small community of Dale, Texas. Uh, while I was booking him, I had to determine which portion of the jail to put him in. So I asked him directly uh, just how far along he had came in his sex change. And uh, he told me it was about halfway, which was not quite sufficient to put him in with the females. I put him in with the males. Michael was returned to Los Angeles in order to serve his original sentence. After two years in a men's prison, he was released. Today, the legacy of Elizabeth Carmichael, also known as Mr. Jerry Dean Michael, and his or her futuristic car has not been forgotten. An original prototype of the Dale is now part of the permanent collection of the Peterson Car Museum in Los Angeles. In 1967, Fauzi Mahmoud was a member of the Jordanian Air Force who had been sent to the United States for pilot training. Bowsy, how are you doing? Do you remember Barbara? Hi. And Zoila. Hi. Hello. When a friend introduced him to 20-year-old Zoila Maldonado, Fauzi was swept off his feet. <laughs> what? I mean, she looked so beautiful to me, and uh, she got this green dress, and just she was a knockout, and I was <laughs> knocked out. <laughs> I fell in love with her. I mean, I fell madly in love with her. <laughs> this is beautiful. It is pretty. Zoila was not only the first love, it was the first woman I ever talked to in my life. Because we came from a very, very strict family and strict people and a strict government, you know. She was uh, my first everything. Oh, Mom, he's waiting. He's... Zoila's parents did not like the idea of their daughter dating anyone. The fact that Fauzi was a foreigner who spoke little English did not help. He's a nice boy. Where is he from? Well, what does it matter? Now. Even though her parents were conservative and strict, we managed to go out almost daily. We went dancing, we went to the lake, we went to the mountains, we went everywhere together. Six months later, Zoila surprised Fauzi with some unexpected news. <sighs> Fauzi, I think I'm pregnant. Good. To Zoila's relief, Fauzi was thrilled. You are? Yes. I want to marry you. <laughs> but the marriage never took place. Several months earlier, war had broken out between Jordan and Israel. Tension between the two countries remained high, and Fauzi was ordered home. Come back, I promise. We talked and we promised and we vowed that we would always be together no matter what happens. When I come back, I can't raise a baby by myself. I can't. You and baby come to Jordan. I just felt so helpless. I come back very soon. Come on, kids, we need to get going. I felt why love should be like that. I mean, we're having so good time together, we're happy. Why the happiness have to go? Zoila and Fauzi continued their relationship by mail. 
The Jordanian Air Force refused to release Fauzi, so Zoila planned to move to Jordan after the baby arrived. When Zoila gave birth to a baby boy, she named him Amadeo Marcello. I mean, I was thrilled. I was very happy, I was jumping, but I also was very uh, uh, unpleased because of the fact that uh, I cannot be there to see him and be with her and be of help to her. I was very frustrated. Fauzi could not wait to bring his new family to Jordan, but back in Texas, Zoila had a change of heart. She felt that she needed a father for her baby, so she wrote Fauzi that she had married someone else. Fauzi could not bring himself to write to Zoila again, but he never forgot his son. Two years later, Fauzi returned to the United States. He tried to call Zoila, but her mother hung up on him and then changed her number. In desperation, he went to Zoila's house. Hello. I'd like to see Zoila, please. Nobody wants to talk to you. My son. I'd like to see my son. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to call the police. No, please, wait. I just want to see my son. Please. Wait. Fauzi could not risk being arrested and possibly deported. Hello. So he left. But he never gave up hope that he would someday meet his son. Today, Fauzi is married and has his own family, but thoughts of Amadeo still haunt him. I would like to see my son. I would like to see how he looks like. I want to hug him. I want to tell him I love him. I mean, there's a lot of things that we did not do together. Maybe we can do it now, even at this age. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, several viewers called to report that both Zoila and her son, Marcello, were still living in San Antonio, Texas. Fauzi called Zoila and then spoke to his son for the first time. A reunion took place about a week later. They continued to stay in touch and see each other on a regular basis. Not all of our stories have a happy ending like Fauzi's. If you have any information about any of our other cases, please contact us at unsolved.com.